I remember asking Paul Wallace once, um, you know, because he's got a religious background and, you know, if, if, if it's all about extraterrestrials having come to this planet and seeded us, etc., etc., how is that going to affect religious people? And he said, well, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. We all come from the same source. And all of these ETs are just our cousins. You know, they're just like us. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever. Um, doing their thing, you know. Um, but source is source. And that doesn't change. And um, I thought that made a lot of sense. Podcast. The opinions expressed on Broaderlands Podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broaderlands Podcast. Sandy, welcome to Broaderlands Podcast. What an honor to have you on. I really mean that. The honor is all mine. I gotta be honest, it's a little nerve wracking to know uh, I'm interviewing the interviewer who's a legend. You know, and uh, I, I, I think you're a legend. I really do. And uh, I know uh, getting into podcasting, this is new and trendy for a lot of people like myself. But you've been doing it for a very long time. And, and I, I, I highly admire you because it takes a lot of work. And um, you're also a great thinker, an author, a, a, a spiritual teacher, coach, a great thinker, mystic. I, I could go down the line, a critical thinker. And so thank you for paving the way for people like myself. Well, yeah, we've all got to help each other. Maybe you can share briefly about who you are and uh, all the things you accomplished you know, throughout your career, if you don't mind. <laughs> Do we really know who we are? <laughs> <laughs> I think that we like to think we know who we are. <laughs> and then every so often something happens and we're confronted with something else. Um, I can tell you. I can tell you what I've done. Um, I can tell you what I like to do and where I've played over the years and what interests me, but I don't really know if I can tell you who I am. I think I'm still discovering that myself. <laughs> so um, I know that from a very early age, all I wanted to do, all I said to my mother that I was going to do was be a writer. And I don't know how I knew that. And I'm going back to about the age of four. Um, but it was something that was there all the time and all through school, everything that I did, whenever we had to kind of choose to go in a different stream in order to get different qualifications, all of my decisions were made around the fact that I am going to be a writer. And when I left mm. school, I went to work for a magazine um, and that was so long ago. It was in the days when you could actually start as a nothing, you know, um, and end up being, you know, the Devil Wears Prada, the chief of the magazine or something. That can't happen these days. But I was very fortunate in that I met people who were really willing to mentor me and help me move from the different departments that I was working in into the editorial, which was my goal. Mm. Um, so I started my career as a journalist um, on lots of different kinds of magazines, some of which, when I reveal the names, people go, <laughs> oh, my God, really? Um, yeah, I mean, um, what else can I tell you? I've written several books. Writing has been my life, but I've always been interested, too, in how how, how things operate in the magazine world. So a lot of the time I would um, do things that at the time were not considered the thing to do just because I wanted to try them out. And one of my big <laughs> is people. I love meeting people. I love watching people. I love knowing, you know, what makes people tick. Why do they do what they do? And um, one of the things that when I was on magazines... You know, it's it's not enough to tell people about an experience that you've had. They want that experience. 
And mm. so I used to make experiences for people. I would have the magazine do things that they'd never done before, like taking over uh, spas, you know, and inviting all our readers along at really cheap rates so that they could get to enjoy the experience. And I realised later on, probably only about 10 years ago, that um, one of the things that I was doing was something that I've come to call resonance marketing, which is meeting people where they're at mm. and getting to know them and asking questions and finding out what they want. And um, it really stood me in good stead when I became um, a director at an advertising agency and I was helping people talk to their customers, you know, mail order um, companies, how could they actually improve their relationship with their customers? So, um, you know, I'm going off at different tangents here, but it all comes back to one thing, and that is communication. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is very close to my heart. It's, um, it's part of who I am. If one looks at my ast astrology, uh, you know, immediately, anyone who knows astrology will say well, she's in the communicate business, you know, um, radio, TV, um, writing, speaking, all of it has been there all the time. So I find that quite interesting because a lot of people don't believe in astrology. Um, but anyway, you're going to have to ask me some questions because I really don't like talking about myself. <laughs> I'm the one that asks the questions. <laughs> well, I, I heard a talk you had with uh, Daniel Levine we were talking about before we started recording. I really loved uh, how you started off with your upbringing because I think you have a powerful message and we all have a beautiful message and with our life journey. Um, and um, part of it, um, I, I don't believe there's any way of leaving this earth with having some form of trauma in our wounds and pain. You know, all of us having this human experience is going to experience some sort of trauma. And um I heard some powerful stuff with, with that talk with you, and I really appreciate it because also like when we have pain and trauma, we, it, it can affect us in di different ways, and it helped jumpstart your career. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, are you talking about um, where I was brought up? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I don't see any of that as trauma or pain. Um my father died before I was born, and I was the youngest of five children, and um, there was no social security in uh, Britain at the time. So it was very hard for people to survive. And um, I and three of my siblings were put into a children's home for a number of years. Um, and although we had contact with my mother, um, we were brought up in a rather kind of antiquated Victorian style you know, children's home, orphanage if you want to call it that. And um, I was very lucky because I was very young and because I was one of the youngest children there, people kind of petted me. So, I mean, it could be very tough in a place like that. And I know that my siblings um, suffered to some extent. I mean, nothing really, really awful. But, you know, it was hard on them and they were not treated as easily as I was treated. Um, but the, you know, looking back on that time, what I see is a great opportunity. Um, you know, I'm a people watcher. I used to sit in trees and under tables and I would watch people. And um, I learned to be amongst you know, lots and lots of children from all different, um, you know, uh, classes, creeds, religions, you name it, and um, in a place where I actually had no real role models. You know, the staff that looked after us, they, you know, they were okay. They weren't particularly mean or anything. We were just, you know, they didn't really take an awful lot of notice. Um, so in a way, I was kind of put in a position where, I learned to bring up myself. Mm. And so I would watch other people, I would learn from other people, and I would take on whatever, you know, um, attitudes and thoughts and beliefs about the world. 
from I don't know where. Um, I think that in retrospect, I actually knew things that I wasn't consciously aware of, like that I was here, you know, this was part of my training ground, if you like, um, that um, I was, you know, this was going to stand me in good stead for whatever I was going to do later in life. And um, so I, I, I know my brothers and sisters all had different recollections of that place and that time. And it was traumatising for one of my sisters. And it galvanised one of my brothers. You know, he understood very early on that if you want to get on in life, you've got to get an education. And so he threw himself into learning and, um, and did incredibly well in his life. For me, it was it was a whole other experience, um, just an experience in empathy and understanding, and um, seeing through seeing through the masks that people put on, mm. you know, to get by in life. So um, yeah, I don't see it as a a bad thing. I think it bit as a good training for me. You, you eventually came up with the um, show. What is going on? I didn't that all come happen? up with that, actually. I okay. didn't come up with that. That um, Own Times magazine and the Own Times Media Network wanted to create a show called What Is Going On? And they asked mm-hmm. me if I would host it. Um, so, I, you know, it's their flagship show. And um, I didn't come up with that, but I did come up with the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Well, my second question is, what is going on with the world um, do, you, do you believe uh, we're going to have we're having some kind of collective awakening? Yes. Are we suffering? We haven't we're in stage four cancer, as some people may say, or are we just in the mud to become a lotus flower? I think that we are definitely having um, an amazing transformation. I think that we probably have tried many times in our history to get beyond this point and we haven't done it. Um, I think that we are going through those pangs if you like you know call them death pangs or birth pangs where one way of being has to collapse and we know Mm. the structures aren't working we know they haven't been working for a long time and there's only one way to change that they've got to come down and you know what's the old saying you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs (laughs) i don't think though that many of us thought it would be quite as chaotic or Mm. as challenging as it actually is, because there's an awful lot of people who are very, very afraid. And that anxiety and fear is palpable. You know, you can feel it in the air. And I think that the old guard, if you call it that, the factions of society (laughs) that don't want change are fighting very hard. You know, a, a good way to explain this to people, especially beginners, is I'm taken back to the Celestine Prophecy, where, um, you know, this is explained very well in that book. Um, you know, when when people who have agendas find that there there is, um, uh, you know, there's a rub, uh, there is restriction, they're, they're having trouble, you know, um, then they get, they get panicky. And so they tighten up all the more and they hold on you know to the strings of whatever it is they've got all the more tightly and they get very um, anxious and I think that we are experiencing that right now so you know the polarization that's taking place is because the more people are waking up the more on the other side people are, are in fear yeah thank you You've interviewed a lot of great minds, great teachers, great thinkers from around the world. Um, who are some of your best people that you've, some of your favorites that you've interviewed and were kind of heart touching and impactful for you? Um, it is interesting, and you know this yourself. Sometimes you meet people, and you know every interview is a good interview. You learn a lot, but occasionally you meet people, and you really connect on a whole other level. And, and that's always wonderful. Dan Millman. I love Dan Millman. I've always admired his work. And um, I've interviewed him a few times now. And I was absolutely delighted 
to find that he is who he is, you know. Mm. Um, I tell you who's impressed me the most is Christopher Bache. LSD in the mind of the universe. Mm. Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> talk about somebody who is so courageous. I mean, when I read, actually, I listened to his book, and I was so blown away that somebody would put themselves through 20, 20 years of these experiences with LSD in order to study consciousness. And it started off as his, his own consciousness, but then it went a lot further. And the way I describe it is he went beyond the beyond. He went beyond any place that I've ever heard anybody talk about. And um, he came back with so much humility, mm. so much humility that, you know, I mean, the man is a, an absolute joy to talk to. There is no trace of ego. And he really took on the experiences he had and he's sharing them with the world. And um, the way he would describe it is that, you know, we are having this wonderful opportunity to let go, let go of everything that isn't working. And uh, as I said, you know, when, when people are made to let go who don't want to let go, they're going to kick up a big fuss. Um, so if we can get beyond that, the vision that he saw of the future human, you know, it's worth it all. Mm. It's well worth it. Similar to someone that had a near-death experience, they come back with more compassion, more understanding, more connected, kind of more in tune with the oneness of life versus yeah. beforehand. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. that. What was the name of his book again? LSD in the Mind of the Universe, Christopher Bache. Yes, uh, I, I don't. I do have his book. I haven't read it yet, but um, I'm, I plan on reading it. Just I've been have so many books. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, you know, in the spiritual arena, do you believe like there's an ego trap with some of these gurus and teachers in our? field uh, you know in, in the spiritual arena uh, yeah I, i've watched that and um and it is sad because i believe that most people you know they go into this arena because they've discovered something and they're so enthusiastic and excited they want to share it um and they do share it and then they build a following and then they have to build a machine in order to keep up with that and then what happens with some people is you know the the following, the audience, the people that they have to employ to do things, um, separates them. You know, they get further and further away from the person that they're talking to. And that distance, you know, creates, um, it creates a situation where you begin to lose, you know, the, the reasons that you were doing this in the first place. And what you're doing becomes like a well-oiled machine. You've got mm. to keep it going. And, you know, in the end, sometimes the tail wags the dog. And we see this with some people who have become so separated from what they started out and the people that they want to communicate with that it becomes unreal. And they lose, they lose that ability to connect and... Um, yeah, they become detached and then it becomes about just keeping the machine going or it becomes about ego or it becomes about money or something. And it's always sad when you see that, but, you know, it is a danger. We've, all of us, all of us, no matter what we're doing, we've got to, you know, keep on checking ourselves all the time because it is so easy to get carried away, you know, and be influenced. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think it's dangerous for anybody, and I gotta constantly be aware of myself. But I can only imagine when some of these famous people in the spiritual arena that become gurus or spiritual teachers and the the way showers and the knowers and, and uh, um, rock stars, basically rock stars, celebrities in, in this arena. Uh, I've seen the change in attitude following them for so many years, yeah. and then 
once they become super famous, then... The yeah. other thing that happens to them, you know, is the bigger the audience they get, the more energy is actually being driven towards them. You know, people have their thoughts, their ideas, they put them on a pedestal, um, they think that they're the guru that's got all the answers. You know, imagine having thousands of people with their energy thinking about you and on a very subtle <laughs> level. That must be very hard to bear. Came up eventually with the No Bullshit Spiritual Book Club. I love that name. How'd you come up with the name for, for first of all? <laughs> Um, well, actually, the title, <laughs> I was a little bit nervous about calling it something like that. And I thought, oh, no, that's not very <laughs> spiritual. Um, but it was Lee Harris who said <laughs> to me, we were having a chat one day and he said, well, what are you going to call it? And I said, well, I'd like to call it. And he said, then do it. So I did. The No BS Spiritual Book Club. And and honestly, that really does um you know, that's what it's all about, because there is a lot of bullshit out there. There really <laughs> is. And the, you know, the mind, body, spirit arena is now worth trillions, trillions. And there is so much fluff or um, worse coming out. Um, and there's, you know, there's companies that want to make a lot of money out of that and spend a lot of money promoting it. And my mm. concern, I was getting pitched um, by books that, you know, I've done these kinds of interviews so many times and how many books can you read on this and this? And if there isn't any substance there, you know, what is the value of that book to, to somebody waking up? And it really began to wear on me. And I thought, no, somebody's got to do something to, you know, to, to provide people with some kind of guidepost. Don't look at that because there's nothing in it. Read that one. And um, as I was thinking this, and it was in the middle of a rent, I was having a little rant with myself, you know, and um, <laughs> the, you know, there was this download and I saw the whole thing fully formed. And I thought, wow, that's genius, you know, but I'm not going to do it because it's too much work. I don't want to be <laughs> doing all that work. And I looked at it for a year. I kept pushing it away. But it wouldn't go away. And at the end of a year, I spoke to a couple of people and they said, you know, you're always being asked to recommend books. You're the perfect person. Mm. So in the end, I thought, well, I'll play with it. You know, I'll put up a website. I'll play with it and see what happens. And I've been playing with it for four years now. <laughs> and um, it's, it's actually surprised me by what it's given back to me. Um. You know, number one, the best interviews I've ever done. The best. Not because of me, because I say the least of any interview that I ever done, have ever done. Um, <laughs> it's because of, the, because of the guests. They're not pitching anything. You know, they're coming to talk about something, you know, their life, their inspirations. And so there's this whole other energy that they're giving off. And they're very unplugged. And they're very um, authentic and they're very vulnerable. And just listening to some of those stories is is astonishing because, you know, when we hear, oh, I, you know, I was doing this and I came across this book and it changed everything for me. And you really understand not the CV, not the official story, but, you know, this is a person just like you who was struggling mm -hmm. to find their way. So we meet these people on a completely different level and I love that and they love it because they get to have what you know is in effect a life review without leaving their body um, and uh, every person who said oh I don't know if I want to do that it sounds like hard work has said to me I'm so glad I did that because I was reminded of where I've come from I was reminded of who I was and how much I've grown and um, so it's it's a gift that keeps on giving to them and to me. Yeah, I love that. When we were talking about picking the 10 books that inspired me, I started flowing. And it's like, it doesn't even come from here. It's coming from here because yes. it's just like this inner flowing of experience and knowledge that I've gained through certain books and, and just learning how to apply this stuff in my life. And 
just the process of change and growth and it, it's just a beautiful process. So yeah, I, I was, I was thinking that the other day and it was just like, wow, it's all coming from here. It's not coming from here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and the other thing is that there are some people who are closer to leaving the planet than others. And to be able to capture their wisdom mm. through the lens of the books that inspired them is wow. You know, what a privilege to be able to do that. Speaking of that, um, what are a few of your favorite books that helped inspire your soul journey? Well, you know, some of the classics, Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, that was a big eye opener. Um, I love The Four Agreements because it is so simple and inarguable, you know. That's it. If you just, if you live your life by that alone, you know, you're doing okay. Um, Chris Bache's book is really important. I've loved all of um, Dan Millman's books because they are so down to earth and practical. Um, there is one book that I came across about, I don't know, six months ago, maybe a bit longer. And immediately I, I said, this is the book that I've been looking for for years. And um, I'm going to interview this woman. Mm. And then I tracked her down and found out that she'd passed away. Mm at a young age um, and it was an amazing book because if you were if you were somebody like me you know I, I've been a skeptic I've been a very interested skeptic mm -hmm. and all the studying and the searching and the seeking that I've done there's always been a little bit of you know well you know is this real and I I like to play where science and spirituality meet I like mm -hmm. to have the evidence because we've got to ground this stuff for people to believe it and I came across this book called Extraordinary Knowing um, by Elizabeth um, I think her name was Elizabeth Mayer M-A-Y-E-R and she was um, a clinical psychologist and she was as straight as straight as straight as you could think you know she wasn't interested in any any of this spiritual stuff and she had an experience that she just could not explain. And wow. it ended up setting her on a path where, well, why isn't anybody, um, you know, researching this stuff? And she started researching it. She became part of the groups that did the original um, remote viewing um, experiments with the CIA, with the backing of the CIA. She's done so much stuff. And right there, all the proof that you could want to give anybody who's a skeptic, she's got it in that book. So I would recommend that to anybody who isn't sure about some of these anomalous experiences. And what was the name of the book? Extraordinary Knowing. I think you. Similar to Pat Pat Price and Ingo Swan, Russell Tart, those guys. You ever see that? Uh, Yes, and, and some of those are mentioned in her book. She's worked with them. She worked mm. with them all. Wow. Um, I mean, she did. She was part of so many experiments. Um, you know, Ions, the people at Ions all know of her. Um, she did some incredible work. And it is just so eye-opening because, you know, it's irrefutable. The evidence is all there. What would you consider a, a, a bullshit book? I mean, I heard Lee Harris say, you're known for throwing a book across the room. Is that true? <laughs> it, it, I've done that more than once. I don't want to name names because I don't like <laughs> yeah, to ask. Um, talk badly about people. But I have to say there is a very well-known spiritual publishing house that isn't quite <laughs> what its founder intended it to be. And um, there have been a few of their books that I've thrown across the room. Because there's just nothing in them. Nothing. And, um, you know, it's sad to see an organisation that has done so so much wonderful work moving down a, an avenue that isn't 100% um, in integrity. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned downloads. What does a download look like for you? How does it feel or look like in your mind? I've had three downloads in my life. I'll call them mm -hmm. downloads. You know, I'm... I always say that I'm not someone who has experiences. That's not strictly true. Uh, you know, I'm more clairsentient than I am anything else, and I just know stuff. 
but I've had three experiences where I'm having a thought and it's as if somebody drops, unfurls, you know, um, a, a screen, a projection, projection screen in front of me and there's a picture on that screen. And when I look at it, it's like within an instant, I understand everything. You know, I get it. I know what it's all about. And um, it's like complete changes of perception in many respects. As I say, I've only had three. Um, and, yeah, they, they're they life-changing. They really are. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You've interviewed Penny Kelly and Paul Wallace, and those are two of my favorites. How was it interviewing them? What have you learned from them? Oh, those are... I love Penny. Yeah, I love she's Penny. Awesome. I've known Penny now for about eight years, and I've interviewed her so, so many times. And what a wealth of knowledge she's got. And Paul, well, how can you not love Paul's work? Um, they're so much fun. You know, I could do it day in, day out. Um, just getting two people together and, you know, well, you know, you're interviewing, you have to create a lot of questions because you don't know if the person you're interviewing is going to dry up or something. Um, but interviewing two people like that, <laughs> you know, wow, wind them up, let them go and just sit back and enjoy it. Um, you know, they're a treat to listen to, and I'm always learning from them. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. You, have you ever had an interview where you're like, oh, shit. Like, darn. I, I've had a couple of interviews. <laughs> I remember um, a publicist friend of mine telling me, oh, you're really going to like this book and this guy, and, you know, he's going to be interviewed by the Chicago Tribune you know, next week. So, yeah, you know, and he's got a reasonable publisher. And um, I never read a book until the week of the interview because otherwise I'll forget it. And I think it was two nights before the interview and I'm reading his book and I threw it across the room. And I thought, well, what am I going to do here? Because he is paraphrasing Byron Katie and Marianne Williamson and they're the best bits of his book. <laughs> when he's paraphrasing somebody else. And there's so much here that I could take issue with. Um, and that didn't completely ring true, but it was too late. I was committed. So I did the interview. Um, and I have to say, he sounded like, you know, he'd been smoking a few things. And um, <laughs> he wasn't particularly enthusiastic. And I asked him a question at one point. I was getting a bit frustrated with him. I asked him a question and said, tell me about this. And he said, I don't know. I don't know about <laughs> that. And I said, well, it's on page 158, you know. There it is. Tell me about it. And he couldn't talk about it. And then I realised he hadn't written the book. His mother had. Wow. And there was a whole little thing that, you know, was revealed after that. Um, but I cut the interview short. I, I just, I thought, I'm just not doing this and <laughs> cut it short and let him go. I did tell his publicist that he needed media training and then his mother complained <laughs> about me um, to his publisher. Um, but, you know, occasionally you'll get one of those. I'm sure you've had one or two. <laughs> yeah, I might have. <laughs> In going back to um, Paul Wallace and Penny Kelly, um, I know they've talked a lot about this, but I wanted to ask you, um, how do you view our hu uh, human origins? Do you believe there were some extraterrestrial beings involved with creation? Absolutely. Or do you believe a Absolutely. divine source or a little bit of both? Um, I think I think definitely extraterrestrial. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot more that's being revealed today and um one of the things that i came across recently i don't know if you've interviewed alan steinfeld um who's got the new reality show he's been doing that for about 30 years and he compares um contact in the desert he's written a new book yeah. about contact and he's got 12 12 well-known people you know in that arena contributing chapters and there was this whole thing about extra 
celestials. And these are beings from a planet where the atmosphere of that planet, you know, you wouldn't get beings that look like us because the atmosphere wouldn't support that. Um, what these beings are like, they're described almost like angels, somewhat diaphanous, um, you know, very white, very loving, um, but not completely, you know, um, clear. You know, the body is very sort of uh, um, amorphous in some respects. And that made me think about all of the different planets there are and all of the different um, kinds of beings that exist, energy beings. And I remember asking Paul Wallace once, um, you know, because he's got a religious background and, you know, if, if, if it's all about extraterrestrials having come to this planet and seeded us, etc., etc., how is that going to affect religious people? And he said, well, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. We all come from the same source. And all of these ETs are just our cousins. You know, mm -hmm. they're just like us. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever. Um, doing their thing, you know. Um, but source is source. And that doesn't change. And um, I thought that made a lot of sense. Yeah, he's right. And it makes sense of the um, egoic God in the Old Testament, right? Yeah, I've talked to Alan. I'm, I got to get him on. Um, I, I haven't reached out to him, but I talked to him last February at the Conscious Life Expo and had a good talk with him. And uh, I also talked to Linda Moulton Howe and I actually asked her about this. And I, because I remember one time she gave a, um, I don't know if it was in a ancient civilizations or ancient aliens, but she said how a gentleman came to her office when she was in New York. And uh, he was in a suit and he told her the origins of humanity. She didn't even know who he was. But um, I, I asked her about it and she confirmed it. So I thought it was pretty interesting. You should have a conversation with Penny Kelly about the brown robes, oh. which is one of her books. And what they told her back in the 70s that would come to pass and has. Yeah, I would love to have a conversation with this. Maybe you can help yeah. me out with that. <laughs> I will. I'll give Penny I, I a nudge. Penny. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, who do you believe truly controls our planet right now? You know, you often hear about the these um, global elites, extraterrestrial influences. Do you believe there's a connection there, or is there a combo of both? I think, I think there are factions that we cannot see um, and don't know much about. That yes, definitely are trying to control and there are also other factions that are trying to stop that if you listen to barbara hanklau she talks about um archons that have been on this planet you know many many millennia um and they're supposed to have some ongoing influence if you speak to somebody like um judy carroll who lives in Australia and has written several books, one of which is called Human by Day, Zeta by Night. Mm. And she talks about the Saurians. And she says the Saurians are the um, descendants of the dinosaurs. Mm. And they are highly intelligent and they have been on this planet long before, um, you know, humans were. And um, they consider it their planet and they are controlling everything. I don't know who's controlling anything. I, I'm sure there are beings that are controlling and I'm sure there are other beings that are equally trying. You know, you've got the polarity. It's a planet of duality, isn't it? You know, we've got to have both. Yeah, you're right. Um, so does she describe what they look like? Were they like lizards? No, she didn't. Reptilians? She didn't say what they looked like. No, she didn't. But she she herself had memory of um, being a Zaytan and um, being, you know, in another life, being um, a commander of a ship. And that was supposed, supposedly uh, in the 40s, um, oh. human time. And they were trying to warn us because of... Um, you know, the whole Oppenheimer thing. 
and the bomb and um and they they were blasted out of the universe by whatever factions were here at the time the saurians um she's an interesting one for you to interview yeah i have to look her up I'll put I, you I don't in think touch I, with i'm not even familiar with her work to be honest so that's interesting yeah her books are very interesting I, I know I had, you said she was in Australia? She's in Australia, yeah. No, I had Mary Rodwell on recently. She was very interesting. She's awesome. That's right. And I'm interviewing her soon. Oh, yeah, she's awesome. I'm That's pushing awesome. her and Su Susie Miller. Do you know Susie Miller? I've heard of Susie Miller, but I don't, I'm not really familiar with her work. Yeah, she's just been introduced by, uh, sorry, interviewed by Jeff Moore uh, very successfully. So I've known Susie for about, I don't know. 15 or more years, 20 years now. And um, she is just an amazing person. And she has been working for nigh on 30 years with the autistic population, with the new kids, the non-verbals, um, multidimensionally, channeling the collective consciousness of the children. And so much of what she's told me that the kids have said over the years, I've seen come true. So I'm putting Susie Miller... Um, with, you know, all of her knowledge of the new kids and Mary Rodwell together, and they're going to have wow. a conversation about, uh, you know, the future human. That's awesome. That's a great idea as well. Yeah. Do, do you know any stories of uh, little kids coming in, remembering past lives? I used to I used to produce a magazine called Children of the New Earth back in wow. the early 2000s, and this was... This was aimed at um, parents of the indigos and the crystal children. And what I was trying to do was ground the information and, you know, so that we could talk to educators and therapists and people who could help these kids. And um, I, I read so many stories of kids that came in and had full memory for a period of time. Um, a lot of them lost it as time went on, but... Um, yeah, I mean, there's too much evidence, far too much evidence of that to, to say it doesn't exist. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, certain environments, certain cultures, and even watching Star Wars and, or Star Trek looked familiar to me, very familiar to me. And it's not just in here, it's like uh, inner knowing, you know, that intuitive yes. knowing. So uh, it's interesting. And then when I had my awakening in 2009, I went back to certain environments with those teachings and stuff, which is nowhere near America. <laughs> this is more in India and ancient China. Yeah, so yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, PMH Atwater is a great person to interview. She's written a lot of books about the kids who have memory, the kids who have memory of lives in between lives, and um, what she calls the sixth root race, which are the new kids. Um, so she's very knowledgeable. She's also had three near-death experiences, and she had she was told she had to write a book for each one. And one oh. of her books, Future Memory, where she started having memory of the future, is astonishing. Yeah, she's a great interview. You said she remembered lives between lives? She's written books about children who've m remembered lives between lives. I can't remember whether she herself has. Hmm. Lives between but, yeah, lives. I mean, there's been, I, I know people who've talked about their child saying, I chose you, mummy. You know, I remember looking at you before I came here and choosing you. I mean, these kids, yeah. What would you say the purpose is in reincarnation? The purpose of life in reincarnation? Well, this is an interesting one because I really don't believe, I don't buy into the idea that we're here in school. You know, we're not as good as we should be and we have to learn to be better. I don't buy that. If we are sparks of source, God, whatever you want to call him, then we have access to all of that. I do think that we are here to shine our light. And... Um, and I have heard that it is in the expression of our being that we create our doing. And 
you know, if you are someone who has had many, many lifetimes and you've gathered many skills um, and you come here, you know, to to sh share those, to use those, to put them to service, um, it makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, the the being that you've become with all of that knowledge and wisdom, um, yeah, you, you know, you're here to share, share that light for the benefit of everybody. You know, I was uh, walking my dog this morning and I, I was listening to an interview of you and um, you brought up Know Thyself and that's one of your favorite mentors, you said. Know Thyself. And uh, I happened to be wearing that shirt when I went to uh, ancient Kemet or Egypt um, last summer, I, I made a shirt that says "Know Thyself" with the onk. And uh, as you're as you're talking, I hear you talking about "Know Thyself." What does that mean to you? Because I, I love that saying as well. I think one of the things that we're here for is to remember, is to remember to stop forgetting in each kind of incarnation. Um, and I think that's when we're going to be the most useful too. But for me. I've always had this drive to know, to know more. And, um, you know, I used to put it down to the fact that I'm a Gemini and we're very heady, mental, you know, we want to know everything. And I used to be really frustrated, physically upset at the thought of dying and not knowing it all, whatever it all was. Um, so I, I was interested in astrology. I was interested in palmistry. I was interested in human design, all of these, you know, different modalities that give you information about who you are. And um, so from a very early age, I was looking, studying all of those things because I want to know who I am. Who am I? Um, I don't know because there's, there's so many different layers. And um, most of us are brought up to see ourselves through the eyes of the people around us. Uh, that wasn't good enough for me. I really wanted to know who am I and what do I have to offer. And so all of those things for me are, li are like the, um, um, you know, uh, what's uh, there's a game. I can't remember the game, but you have this little thing. And each time you have to put a little triangle into part of this circle. And to me, all of those things are part of that. And you begin to learn, putting all those little chips together in one, you begin to learn the totality of who you are. And, um, you know, human design has given me certain things. Astrology has given me other things. Gene Keys, I think, is amazing because mm. it also helps you learn, you know, what are you actually dealing with here? And, you know, how the different levels, how you can move through that. And I think that is our job, is to know ourselves. Because when we know ourselves, then a lot of the, you know, the insecurities, um, the things that are piled onto us, the conditioning, etc., goes. You know, we know who we are and we can't be influenced by that. And then we become effective. You know, and you can't fight yourself when you know who you are. I mean, mm. you know, I think I know what I'm here to do and I'm very happy to know that. It's not what I thought I was here to do for the first, you know, 25, 30 years of my life, but I'm very happy, you know, in knowing that. And yeah, that's my job. Okay, get on with it. Do it and do it to the best of your ability. And thank you. I would say the greatest minority in today's world has nothing to do with skin color but it's authenticity and the process of knowing who I am begins with knowing who I'm not. And when I had my awakening, I started to realize like, wait, this is what someone told me to believe. Wait, this is what my culture collectively are, is thinking. Oh, this is my environment influenced me. Do I really believe that? Is that really me? Or this is how I put up this persona to hide behind because deep down inside, I feel scared. You know, when I started to see all these different ways and et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I always say the beginning of enlightenment is when the unconscious becomes conscious and I start to become more conscious, more aware of how these things are not really me and how they affect me and cause me, cause my suffering and disconnection with self 
and conscious separation between me and you. Yeah. And it's changed and my I life. All pain comes yeah. from, you know, not knowing who we are, thinking that we're not good enough. We don't measure up to whoever's standards, you know. Once you, you know, this is me, you know, and rightly or wrongly, you know, good or bad, this is me. How would you define the ego? I know we talked about it a little earlier. Um, I, th I don't think the ego is a bad thing. I think we need a certain amount of ego, you know, in order to do things and push ourselves forward, etc. I think it's, you know, ego gets a, a bad rap, but I think that there are levels, you know, of how much we are into certain aspects of whatever um, that can be less than advantageous, you know, to us and to others. I think that, um, you know, there's an awful lot being said these days, um, you know, about selfishness, selfish versus self first, um, you know, um, narcissism. Um, and I think that we're in a culture where people are encouraged, they are encouraged um, in the direction of, you know, pay attention to yourself because you're not good enough. You know, I've only got to look at, well, I don't look at it, but I've got grandchildren, granddaughters, and I see how influenced they are by, you know, the Kardashians or people on Instagram who are not, who don't know themselves. You know, the false eyelashes, the, you know, the blown up lips that, that everybody's hiding behind a mask. And it, everything seems to be pushing these kids away from knowing themselves and, you know, telling them they should be something else. And I think that that's where it all becomes damaging. And I think their egos suffer greatly. And, you know, they're being taught to be egotistical. You know, which I just is, got... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, which is, you know, not healthy. But carry on. You know, I said, you know, I just got butt implants, right? You got butt implants. No, I was, playing, I was messing around. <laughs> no, I agree with you because like Eckhart Tolle, I love Eckhart Tolle, but I think it becomes a little too... The ego's too dangerous in his point of view. Along with A Course in Miracles, the evil's like the bad, super bad. But I think, yes, you can have an unhealthy ego. And when you're unconscious of the ego... I would say the ego is not your amigo when you're unconscious of it, but you can create a healthy ego. It's a sense of self. I mean, if I'm going to fall off a cliff, my ego is going to tell me I'm going to die. You know, at least this experience, right? Because I don't believe who we really are dies, but this as me as a human being will die physically um, if if I get too close to this cliff or certain things like that. So I appreciate your take on that. It's not very popular. Yeah, I think that you know. Um... If you think about it, if you, you've got a podcast and you want that podcast to be the best it can be, um, is that egotistical? You've got standards. And if you say, no, I'm not going to have that because, you know, I want it to have this. That's not egotistical. You know, that is you knowing that you want to present something that's helping others and you want it to be something that benefits them. So you have a certain standard around it. Um that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. And I think, you know, we really need to teach our kids certain... They're not getting the opportunity to learn what they need to learn about some of these things. We are becoming a an inward-looking, in the wrong way, um, society. You know, nothing against inward-looking. But if all you're doing is thinking about, you know, how can I make my eyelashes longer or my lips bigger or my butt bigger, you know, <laughs> and look better because I'm not good enough as I am, then then that's harmful. That's distraction. How, yeah, you're right. How was it li living in the UK versus America? Because you've been in both. Well, you know, Gemini, I have to have two of everything. Um, <laughs> and... I have always had a love affair with America since, I think, since I first heard the word when I was a child. Um, America's in my chart, so I have a deep bond. And the way I describe it is my soul's in America, but my heart's in England. 
Mm. Given the opportunity, I would live in America, but my children are here, my mother's here, um, my grandchildren are here, um, and so I have to do both. I have to do both. I do America for me, and I do England for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Where do you see humanity going in the next several years? Because like we all want like security, we all want connection, we want to feel loved, you know. We all want the common things that a human being needs. Um, do you believe we're going that direction or are we going to a, a state of self-destruction? I think ultimately we are going in that direction. I don't think we're necessarily going to get there in my lifetime. I think that we are going to have some tough years. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what your year's been like. You know, Pam Gregory, they've all been telling us what to expect. And even knowing what to expect, it's been hard. I found it hard than that. Um, it's not easy, but I think what we are going through is a wonderful opportunity for us to practice finding out who we are and staying centered in our own energy and not allowing the noise around us to keep distracting us. You know, we have to keep coming back to, you know, why am I here? What am I doing this for? What is the bigger picture? And ultimately, I think the bigger picture is healthy. And um, and it's an attractive picture. And we will get there. But I don't think that I will see it in my lifetime. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions. Spirituality versus religion. Do you see a difference? Yes, absolutely. Spirituality. Um, and uh, religion for me can, you know, there's some, can be some wonderful things to certain religions. Um, but I think the dogma, um, you know, um, so for me, it has to be open, wide open. And it is a verb. It is, you know, how you live your life, what you do, not what you think or believe. And how would you define spirituality? How would I define spirituality? I think it's having an awareness of something bigger than the self, than the small self, um, having an awareness of um, values and consciousness and kindness and the way we interact with one another. Um, a lot of people profess to be spiritual, but they don't behave spiritually, you know. Mm. Um, it's really in the way you live your life. And you don't have to, you know, like the spiritual arena or be a devotee of that in order to live your life in a spiritual manner. Yeah, thank you. I always say, um, you know, at one part of my life, I suffered from alcoholism. Today, once in a great while, I suffer from assholism, but I have tools to use to help get rid of that assholism. And I learned how to make my wrongs right, you know, and try to stay connected with humanity and, and self versus yeah. getting disconnected. So, yeah. And, and we live in a human experience, you know. We, we need to have a bit of compassion for ourselves, you know. We are stuck in this body and in this place and with all of this conditioning around us. And I think that we should allow ourselves, you know, not beat ourselves up if we cannot hold ourselves 100% to being spiritual, whatever that means for us. You mean we're not just sinners? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. I'm just playing around. How would you define... Um... Sin. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Self-inflicted nonsense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How would you define what we call, some people call God or source of life? I, my views kind of change. The more that's being discovered, quantum physics about the cosmos, my views change. Um, I really like what um, Jude Carrivan says, that consciousness is not what we have, it's what we are. Now, consciousness to me is the same thing as source. And 
if that is what we are, then, you know, it's everything and everywhere. And we can't say, you know, sources over there and it looks like this. Um, <laughs> it is, you know, it's probably too big to even articulate. Um, but yeah, consciousness is what we are. We are part of everything. And, and that is source. So we are source too. I love that. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Um, would you like to share any of your links or, or website? Um, I'd love for people to go visit um, sedgebeer.com where they can also find um, the No BS Spiritual Book Club and uh, sign up for it. It's completely free. We just send you uh, emails about, you know, the latest um, 10 best lists that have been added to the archives and the interviews that are coming up. Our mission is to support people, so support people in their spiritual growth. And um, there are no gimmicks, there are no fees, there's nothing else there other than, um, you know, a great vast library of recommendations given by people that we all admire. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to end it with Toth the Atlantean from the Emerald Tablets. And I think this quote fits perfect for you. And he said, read and be wise, but only if the light of your own consciousness awakens the deep-seated understanding, which is the inherent quality of the soul. and uh, That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Boo Boo. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, and I can't wait to have you on my show. <laughs> it would be an honor. Namaste. Turn the tables on you. <laughs> Just know we out here. No, we all here working in a major way. Had to speak on it just to make a play. Any given subject, no, we make a way. Time to level up on the day to day. No, we all here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, broaden your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy to speak on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood.